Well, last week we started a two-part conversation on community and all of those things, and we are going to continue part two today. You know, last week I talked about the fact that there's so many things that we buy that have all of these promises attached to them, and I told you about the fact that I went out and bought volumizing shampoo, and I think all it did was increase the volume that I lost. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, there was this one commercial, and I know a lot of you, especially the guys in here, will remember this commercial. It starts off with this great guitar riff, and it's, um, I, I think it's like from an Eminem song, I'm not really for sure, but it's got this great guitar riff, and uh, it's, it's this brand new Chrysler that's just been introduced. How many of you know the, the commercial I'm talking about? It's right after the government bailout. So you didn't see this one. You had to see this one because it was popular. It was right after the, the bailout of Chrysler, and Chrysler was, was just pushing this brand new product. And I remember thinking to myself, sitting with my son, because I have a Chrysler. Marianne likes to make fun of my Chrysler. She calls it a drug dealer's car, but it's really not. Uh, <laughs> a drug dealer's car. It, uh, anyway, I, I have a Chrysler 300. It's like five or six years old. And I remember sitting there watching this commercial, and I'm thinking, wow, they are unveiling the brand new Chrysler, and it's going to be awesome. And I looked over at my son, and I'm like, this is going to be so cool. And, I, you know, they have a Chrysler 300, so this must be at least a, a 400 or a 500 or a 1,000, whatever. And then it says this is the Chrysler 200. And you're like, all that money you just got to bail us out and you came out with a car that's a hundred less than what you already had. My sense of humor is messed up, isn't it? But it promises to be the whole thing. If you want a great Chrysler, get a 300. But anyway, um, y'all are not into me this morning. I, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. Fathers, were you up partying last night? You better not have been. Jesus knows. <laughs> All right. So today we're going to talk about community, and so let's go to the Lord in prayer. So Father, I come before you this morning, and I thank you for your love and your mercy. I thank you for your grace. Uh, Father, I, as we move now to talk about you and about your plan for community and about your plan for us, Father, I pray that um, our hearts would be open, our minds would be open to your voice. I pray that your spirit would lead and guide. In your name I pray. Amen. And you're not supposed to see the, oh, there you can see this one. So um, last week, I just want to take us through a little bit of what we talked about last week. Last week, we talked about the fact that community is kind of an obscure word, almost to the point where we've almost lost touch with what that word means. And, and we've seen so many signs within our culture of, of, of people trying to create community. And yet, a lot of times community is, is offset and it doesn't work because it's usually something that we try to create ourselves. But yet what I want you to know, especially on this diagram up here, is that community starts first and foremost with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They, they exist in perfect harmony, perfect communion. And I don't know if you remember this or not, I'm gonna take for granted that you do, but there was a part of this community that we became involved in, and it, and it really showed up in John 17 and Colossians chapter 3, because it, uh, Jesus prays in John 17, Paul is instructing in Colossians 3, and he says this, it says that Jesus said, I pray that their life, that they will be one like you and I are one, and that they will be in you as I am in you, and you are in me, and they're in you. And, and it's this weird kind of combination, and we notice that the Holy Spirit is left out. The same thing is true when we go to Colossians chapter number 3. He says, your life is hidden in Christ, in God, but yet we see again that the word Holy Spirit is not mentioned there. But we went on to look at the fact that this is actually not a problem because the Holy Spirit lives where? In us. And so because of that, we are actually introduced, brought into fellowship 
with the Trinity itself. That we are part of this triunion in a way that our minds cannot even begin to fathom. That we are in the Godhead. It, how many of you can like fathom that? It, it, it blows my mind. And so it's because of that work that we can talk about community. It's the basis that God has laid for you and I to exist together. So today we are going to talk about community. Now, we have... What? Hey. Huh. Huh. I bet y'all are thinking I put that down there because I'm fat, huh? The head wasn't big enough for my name. I had to put myself in there somewhere. But anyway, the, the human condition, uh, this human community that we're part of. And, and so how do we begin to work together in a human condition, in this human way, reflecting what we are part of spiritually. And so today we're gonna to talk about part two of community. And so what I would like for you to do at this time is I would like for you to look up at the screen if you do not have a copy of scripture. If you do have a copy of scripture, I'm gonna ask that you open it up to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Now some of the things that we're gonna to cover today, we've heard a lot of. We've heard these verses before, but what I want you to know is there's some very key, important things that we need to draw out of these texts. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 says this. It says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good work. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. There's a few things here that I would like to point out. This is commonly talked about uh, all the time about, hey, you need to start coming to church. The Bible says you need to be in church, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it, it's a little bit deeper than that. There, there's more going on there than that. And what I would like to show you is this. It's first of all, the word consider that we see up here means not, not just to sit down and have a conversation, but it means to contemplate. It's, it's a deep, ongoing process. It's something that you're thinking, you're talking about. And then it says this. It says, motivate or stimulate. Now, interestingly enough, this word caused me a little bit of problems because stimulate comes from kulios, which is out of the word, the root word, kulio. Now, what is interesting about this is that this word means to be crippled or to be maimed. It kind of throws you off guard a little bit. It kind of throws you off base, doesn't it? Because it says, let us stimulate one another to good works. Now, one of the things about Scripture that we all need to know is this, is that Scripture was meant and written in a way that it was to point us to and create a picture in our minds. Do you, do you follow me? How many of you ever have an issue like that where you're looking, you see a photograph and all of a sudden something jumps into your mind. How many of you do that? How many of you just look at the picture and keep turning pages? Okay. Anyway, there's more to life, right? And so when you look at the pictures, like last week, how many of you like follow me on Facebook? Anybody follow me on Facebook? Like look at my stuff on Facebook? Last week there was a really funny picture of Donald Trump and he's like this. And it reminded me of teaching a kid to hold his car steering wheel at 10 and two. See how my weird my mind is? Like, it's just so weird. So anyway, what we have here is a picture. It says, basically the picture is describing this, that if we do not come together, and if we don't start contemplating, and if we don't start thinking together and reasoning together, how to be motivated into good works, it paints the picture that we're kind of maimed and crippled spiritually that we will wallow in our own selfishness, not selfishness, but selfishness, my own self, my own stuff, my own group, my own clique, 
my own friends, and if we're not careful, we will absolutely sit and wallow in it. I think that's happened quite a bit, hasn't it? It has. Why? Because it's so easy. It's so easy to get stuck in that routine. And what happens is, is that we begin to forget about the people on the outside of the walls. We begin to forget about the people within the walls that maybe we don't know or are not familiar with. And we just become comfortable in our own little rut. And what happens is, is this passage of scripture, the writer of Hebrews is imploring us, don't cripple yourself that way. Don't walk around wallowing in this mess. So you as believers, as we come together, we need to be stimulated. We need to be considered and stimulating each other to good works. Now, what I love about good here, this is an amazing word. It, it talks about expressing beauty, but I want you to notice the next word. It says expressing beauty, harmonious completeness people doing what they do that they're spiritually gifted to do, people doing good. But what I love about this is the word harmony. Now, I will tell you this, there, there was a lot of years that I actually said to my parents, you, you can tell me if I'm adopted. Because my dad is a professional drummer, my mom has a beautiful singing voice, my brother that you hear me brag about a lot is uh, a worship pastor in Nashville, Tennessee at a very large church. He plays the keyboard, he plays the percussion, he plays guitar, and he sings. My sister, she's got a beautiful singing voice, and she plays guitar, and she plays piano. I can't even play the radio right. <laughs> I have zero skills at all none my son will tell you we'll be in the car listening to something on the radio i'm sure it's edifying and i'm drumming away and he just shakes his head he just i've got no rhythm do i connor none at all i've got none and so when i look at this i love the word harmony because what it's talking about is not that we need to be stimulated to 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 this community where we're having conversations about how to do good so that everybody looks the same. It's how to do good so that there's harmony. How many of you like orchestra music? Believe it or not, I love orchestra music. How many of you in here play the brass section? How many of you know what I'm saying? Okay, well, I don't like the brass section. <laughs> Anyway, I'm, I'm into the strings. I'm into the violins, the cello, the bass, and all of those nice, calm-sounding things. I mean, sometimes the, I guess I must have listened to too many young people playing trumpet it, to sound like a clanging clong and whatever. It was just, and it just, yeah. But anyway, I love the strings, and it, it's soothing. And I love watching how an orchestra just kind of comes together how it just starts not in unity, but in harmony. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes? Okay. If you don't, it's okay. I get it. But harmony. And that's what it's talking about here. How can we come together and stimulate each other so that we can begin doing good? And this good will actually create harmony amongst us. Now, isn't that a cool picture of community? A community that is working together and there's just, we kind of hit our own rhythm and we kind of have our own harmony taking place and it, and it sounds beautiful. Amen. And then it says deeds. Now this is interesting here because the word deeds mean do it like you're employed to do it. Don't do it like it's an option, but do it like you're employed to do this, like you're employed to. So do good deeds like it's your job, amen? And then this last part, I, I want us to notice this because a lot of times in, 
when, especially when we're younger, we how many of you teach your kids to like memorize scripture and Sunday school, they memorize scripture and boys club. Well, I think that's great. But a lot of times what we do is we kind of disconnect verses from other verses and they're not supposed to be disconnected. And in this case, these verses are supposed to be together because it says, come, let us reason together. Let us stimulate each other, figure out how to motivate each other to do good deeds, to love and to do good deeds. Now, how is that possible? Well, verse 25 tells us, it says what? By meeting together. That this happens when we come together like this or within our small groups or within leadership training or whatever, that we are encouraged to do these things to create harmony in our community so that that harmony attracts others to our community. How do we do this? It's by meeting together. So let's not forsake meeting together as some do. But let's make sure that we do more and more, especially as the day of Jesus is approaching. Amen? So this is an incredibly beautiful passage of Scripture because one of the things that I love about this, and I think it's one of the things that for those of you that know me best and have worked with me in one shape, form, or fashion, I love togetherness. I love doing things together. I don't like being the Pope or the high grand whatever who dictates. and I don't like that. How many of you know me would say yeah? Whew, thank you. Uh, I, I, I love doing things together. I love touching on other people's giftedness. I love seeing what other people have to offer and other people's insights into things and coming up with plans together so why? Because we can be in harmony. In harmony, we all kind of working at our gifts and, and man, you just begin to hear this rhythm, see this rhythm, feel this rhythm, and it's a beautiful thing, amen? So I love this. So the very next thing that really pops up into my mind is this answers the question why community is, port, is important, but it doesn't really tell us how to accomplish it, right? It gives us the why, but it doesn't give us a method. And so what I would like to do is I would like for you to look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Now we read these passages of scripture over and over again and we uh, get into these lists. And a lot of times these lists we just kind of skip over, don't we? How many of you like reading the Old Testament? Man, how many of you like getting into the genealogies? Sam, you're the only person I know. I love you, brother. I'm going to miss you. Uh, The genealogies are crazy. Even at some point, Pastor Shane skips things. The genealogy, once you've read it a couple of times, I have a hard time getting into it again. I'm just being honest. All right? How many of you feel the same way? Good. At least I'm not alone. So anyway, and the funny thing is, is we all read it like we know how to pronounce their names. And we really don't. We're given our best guess at how to pronounce their names. Uh, And you know the one Bible character, Habakkuk? I remember as a little kid, I used to call him Tabaka. Because anyway, so... In Colossians chapter 3, there's, there's this interesting passage of Scripture that I think all of us have read quite a bit, but when it gets into the list, we just kind of turn our brains off. And we're like, yeah, 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 that sounds great. But I want us to actually look at what Colossians 3 is saying because this is the process by which we create or maintain, sustain, and grow this community that God is wanting us to do. In Colossians chapter 3, it says this, Since God chose you to be holy people he loves, listen to this next two words, you must. Did you notice that? It's not an option. How many of you have ever, like, been with your parents and they're talking to you and finally it goes, this is not open for debate anymore? You're going to do what I tell you to do or I'm going to kill you. How many of your kids know what I'm talking about? Yes, okay, thank you. 
this is Paul saying here, Mackenzie, I have never threatened to kill you. Okay. Tell stories on me. Threatened to throw you out a window, but that's beside the point. I'm just playing, church. So anyway, it says here, Paul says, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace from Christ rule in your hearts. For as a member of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. What I would like for us to see here are just a, a few things. Number one, it says, since you are holy and holy people, you must, underscore, you must. This is not um, an option. This is, you must do this. You must clothe yourself. Now, a lot of times we read tenderhearted mercy as what we should clothe ourselves in, but we need to clothe ourselves in all of these things. That's why it says, and put on love, okay? So it says that we must clothe ourselves with mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Doesn't that sound attractive? Doesn't it sound attractive to be part of something like that? I don't know about you, but I don't have my life all together all the time. I really don't. I, I make mistakes. I know that surprises you. But I do. I guess wrong sometimes. Sometimes I lay out the wrong plan. Sometimes I'm, I'm grumpy and I'm irritable. And sometimes I'm not nice. But wouldn't it be awesome to be part of a community that when we're all in that shape that we're treated with mercy and kindness, humility, gentleness, patience? Who doesn't want to be part of that? That people love you so much that they're willing to give you this, not only because they have to, but because they want to. But then look at this next set of things that... I, as the list grows, I, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but as the list grows, it gets, it, it gets harder to complete. It, it starts off where you're like, yeah, I, I can do this. I can do this. I, Lorraine, I can, I can do this. And then we get to this part and you're like, oh, oh, you had to go that far. Make allowances for each other's faults. This one, forgive anyone who offends you. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. I can forgive them. I ain't never talking to him again, but I can forgive him. But then Paul puts this nice little stipulation clause in there. Forgive him the way that the Lord Jesus forgave you. Oh, man, I really don't want to. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Forgive them the way that God has forgiven you. And above all, Put on love. Love brings what? Harmony. There it is again. Harmony. See, I really think that you know, Jesus is really trying to tell us through Paul that it's more than just people getting along, but it's people getting along in such a way that it's almost like a symphony. And how does that work? Well, it's through love. How, how many of you have ever heard a violin screech the wrong note? And you can't miss it, right? But yeah, what happens when it the screeches the wrong note, but then all of a sudden everybody like, it's okay. It's just a bump in the road. Keep playing. Keep playing. Then all of a sudden the person starts playing again and all of a sudden the, the harmony begins again. So many times in church life we're 
We're so strongly opposed to when people make mistakes. When people don't fit. But yet here it says, above all, put on love. Live in peace. And the last one, be thankful. You know, this last week was an was, um, interesting week. I watched as the greatest minds of a denomination that I used to be part of come together and send out an ordinance or a clause of what they believe about marriage and what they believe about people who don't believe in that the lesbian and gay community. And I'm not sitting here being pro that. I'm not, just don't misinterpret me. But what I'm saying is, is that church didn't act in love. It didn't act in peace. So when the world hears that, do they hear harmony? Do they hear something that they want to be part of? Are they attracted to be part of something that says, hey, you're human just like all of us and you're fallible just like all of us and we love you. And no, that's not what they heard. They heard we're against you. That is not what God ordained. Do, do you hear me, my brothers and sisters? When people don't know Jesus, we have to understand they're going to act like they don't know Jesus. And after they come to know Jesus, there's going to be times where they act like they don't know Jesus. And don't act like you always act like Jesus. Because I know you and you know me. We're supposed to be a community defined by harmony. How does that harmony take place? By living this type of lifestyle. By living a lifestyle that says to people, if I can put it simply this way, wouldn't it be great to be part of a community that we ourselves, the reason why I'm able to live in this community is because God has brought me into that community with him. God has brought you into that community with him. And the Holy Spirit lives and resides in each one of us. And as the Holy Spirit begins to take over our lives, we begin to live a certain way. And then our community begins to change a little bit. And all of a sudden, we can be a community defined by the fact that whoever you are, Whatever's going on, you are loved, you are accepted, and you are valued. Doesn't that sound like the type of community that you want to be part of? Amen? Yes? Because isn't that what Jesus has said to you? That you are loved, that you are accepted, that you are valued? Immensely, imagine a community, Dalhousie Church, who is known that no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, forget all of that. You are loved, you are valued, and you are accepted. We will love you, we will forgive you, we will act gently, we will act in mercy and compassion and humility and gentleness. Who would not be attracted to the kingdom? See, I do believe that this community is possible. And Dalhousie Church, I really believe in our potential. I see it. I see it all the time as your pastor. I see it popping up here and there. And I see it across the aisles. And I see it across the generations. And my brothers and my sisters, I want to say amen to that. Continue to do that. Let's... Let it grow. Outside of our little circles and outside of our friendships and outside of these walls. As your pastor, I want you to know that's what I want us to do. That's what I want us to be. And I will fiercely protect that. You know, there's things, how many of you have things that just kind of set you off. Come on, raise your hands. Those of you who don't raise your hands, I feel like you're hypocrites and you need to see Jesus. I'm just playing. 
but you know what I'm saying. You, you, you feel like there's certain things that just set you off. You know there's certain things that set me off. I know that's hard to believe that your pastor could be set off. I know you struggle with that. Uh, Lorraine knows that ants are one of those things. When I find ants in my office, it, it twigs me because I don't like things crawling around me that I can't see. Just so you know, you put one on me. I, anyway, no, whoa, 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 I'm peaceful. Um, but there's things that set us all off. The thing that sets me off as a pastor is gossip. Pride. Not going to the brother, and, but yet we go to everyone else. Complaining. It's too cold, too hot, too loud, too soft. Filling each other's ears with this stuff. And I can tell you this, if you act like a wolf, I'm going to treat you like a wolf. Amen? You have my permission, Tom. Okay. Sam, you're leaving, but you can for the next few hours. But here's my thing. Well, I, I'm, I'm kind of being facetious there, but I do want you to know that that stuff twigs me. It twigs me. Why? Because that's the enemy getting in, disrupting who we are, disrupting our harmony, disrupting all of that. And yet God wants us to do the other thing. So why don't we do this together, church? Let's, let's say the community is important to us. Not just this community, but the community outside the walls that need what this is. And let's do this. Paul says, endeavor, do everything you can do to keep the unity, to keep the peace, to protect this. Amen? Amen? Well, let us pray. Father, I come before you and I thank you and praise you for your word. I thank you for what you're doing amongst us, Father. I love the excitement that I'm hearing of things that are taking place and people who are volunteering and uh, the growth and the young families and all of these things, Father. I'm thankful for who you're bringing. I'm thankful for who you already have established here through the years. Father, I pray that as we grow more together and we grow more mature and grow in you, that we would be this picture that you've written in Scripture, that we will not forsake assembling together, not for our own benefit, but for others. Father, I deeply desire to see harmony. Harmony. The beautiful completeness of harmony here. In your name I pray.